I tell you, these Asian tigers are relentless. Like, no joke, it is definitely the most ferocious animal in our environment. The Asian tiger mosquitoes, not actual tigers. So, uh, how you guys doing? I'm Chris Ignato, and today's video should be a pretty exciting one. It is about Specius speciosus, also known to you and me as the cicada killer. And these are magnificent animals. I am not exaggerating in any way when I tell you that its bark is definitely worse than its bite. Get a load of these animals. They are incredible. Cicada killers are a type of wasp that belong to the family Cabranidae, often referred to as digger wasps. They also share another name known as sand wasps. They're generally solitary wasps, but it's not uncommon to see more than one female sharing a burrow for her own benefit. Now, unfortunately, cicada killers are often mistaken for the invasive murder hornet, also called the Japanese hornet. Cicada killers are completely non-aggressive whatsoever, and they are a native species. They're a very important species because they actually help to keep the native populations of cicadas in check. Without them and various bird species, these cicadas would probably run rampant. Another cool tidbit is the fact that cicada killers pretty much synchronize their life cycle with the emergence of cicadas because they completely depend on cicadas for food for their larvae. Adult cicada killers rarely feed on anything except for a little taste of sap here and there and maybe a sample or two of flower nectar. But generally, they don't feed. Their sole purpose in life as adults is to find a mate and reproduce. The main prey of choice for cicada killers are, of course, the annual cicadas. Species such as the dog day harvest fly or dog day cicada, and around here especially, the swamp cicada. The reason for that being is every year there's generally a population of these annual cicadas. If they were specializing on the periodic cicadas, they'd have to wait like every 11 to 17 years. It's not going to work out too good for them. And of course, it's the immature or larval form of the cicada killers that do most of the feeding. They will be parasitizing on the immature cicadas that have been paralyzed beneath the ground paralyzed by, of course, the female cicada killer to provide food or larder for her offspring. Just one cicada will provide food for the immature cicada killer for about two weeks, give or take. After it's done feeding on that cicada, that cicada killer larva will spin itself a silken cocoon and then spend many months, pretty much throughout the winter, in that silken sleeping bag. Then it'll form a nice hard pupil case and in two to three weeks, give or take, it'll metamorphosize into an adult cicada killer. Say early to midsummer, depending on where you are, it'll break free of that, that hard case and emerge as a fully developed adult cicada killer. Like most invertebrates, the females definitely outlive the males. I mean, the males die shortly after mating, whereas the females, they get to live long enough to not only dig those burrows, but to stuff them with cicadas, and of course lay eggs on them so that they can perpetuate the species of cicada killer. Another interesting thing that happens to be fairly common in the world of wildlife is the fact that the males show up on the scene first. In this case, the males will hatch first usually a couple weeks before the females and that allows them to kind of establish and dominate their territory. You know, fend it off from other competing males. So that when the females do show up, they've already got their territory staked out and claimed. And one male might even wait at the burrow entrance that the females are using so that he can mate with any females that, you know, come through there. And it's kind of neat. There are times where you might find 
one or two females surrounded by a whole bunch of males forming like kind of a mating ball, similar to what you see going on with like garter snakes, for instance. It's pretty cool stuff. And you know, something else, you know, that always shows up first are some of the, the songbirds. You know, males show up on the scene first to establish the territories and attract the females in with their songs. Um, amphibians such as frogs will do the same thing. The males will find the vernal pools or ponds. They'll start to sing. The females kind of come out of the landscape and they're like, oh, I can hear the guys. I can hear the pool, the beach, somewhere down that way. And then they show up and, you know, then, well, you know what comes next. Most of the cicadas harvested by cicada killers are female. A good 70% of them in most cases will be female. And I can't really find much information as to why that's the case, but I do have a couple of theories. When it comes to invertebrates and stuff, most of the time, the females are definitely larger than the males. And that is to allow them to produce either a greater number of eggs or larger eggs to give their offspring a better chance at survival, you know? And so if you're providing food for your offspring, you want them to have a good food source, right? A good larder of food. And finding females will provide that. My other theory, I think, is the fact that the male cicadas have larger hollow resonating chambers within their abdomens. You know, they have this big empty cavity in their abdomen that basically amplifies the call that you hear cicadas making. That's what allows them to be so loud. So that whole empty chamber, that empty space, isn't going to have any food in it, is it? It's just air, right? Whereas the females, well, they're not really calling so much to attract mates. And so perhaps that empty space is taken up with more nutrition. Of course, like most parasites, the, the immature cicada killers will feed on the non-vital organs first to keep its food supply alive longer before they dig into the more crucial organs that are necessary for life. Impressively, just one cicada killer can harvest as many as a hundred cicadas in her short lifetime as an adult. It's a lot of cicadas, isn't it? Although most of the time, it'll be noticeably less than that. So how do cicada killers actually differentiate between male and female cicadas, you might ask? Well, it's probably due to their eyes. You know, they've got these massive eyes. So that suggests that they're really good at seeing either at night in the dark or for spotting prey at a distance and telling the difference between male or female. Just look at how big those eyes are. I mean, they gotta be used for something. There's no point in developing eyes so big unless they serve a fairly important purpose. They don't actually rely on listening for the calls of male cicadas saying, oh, I don't want that one. I want the one that's not singing because that's a female, right? Um, but I have another theory there too. I do know that cicadas, especially some male cicadas, will release pheromones or perfumes to attract females. Maybe the cicada killer detects those pheromones with her antenna or something, and she's like, oh, that smells like a male. And then, you know, she looks somewhere else and she's like, that smells like a female. That's good eating. Now, when a cicada killer finds her prey, she'll either, one, attack it straight out of the sky, or two, hunt it down within the branches and leaves of the tree until she zeroes in on her target. She'll go right up to it, and sting it with that powerful paralyzing venom. And that, that venom does its work in no time. In just a minute or two, that cicada will be totally paralyzed. And then the cicada killer will literally pick the cicada up with her super strong legs and carry it off kind of in a gliding motion down to the ground to her favorite location where she's gonna be working on her burrow. These burrows are usually around 10 inches deep or so, but they could be as much as two feet deep. And usually these burrows have several chambers coming off of them. Each chamber will be stuffed with one, sometimes more cicadas. 
Each cicada will generally have one egg on it. So each egg or larva gets one cicada to feed on before it goes into that silken sleeping bag. And as she lays her eggs, she can actually choose the sex of her offspring. And it's not the legs that do all the heavy lifting. Oh no. She has these highly modified saber-like jaws that she uses to hold on to her prey and either take to the wing or drag it along the ground. It's those long sickle-shaped jaws and a massive thorax packed with muscle that enable her to actually carry off such large prey items. If you saw my cicada video, you probably remember me saying that cicadas have been around for a very long time. I'm willing to bet that cicada killers have been around for almost just as long. I mean, think about it. These wasps have a highly specialized venom, perfectly honed for neutralizing and paralyzing cicadas, right? For something to grow so specialized and so perfectly honed for its prey item, chances are it took a very long time to get that, that specialized. Probably been around for almost just as long as the cicadas themselves. Looking closely at the cicada killers, you can notice a couple of things. One, they're massive. They're very scary looking, and of course they have black and yellow aposomatic coloration. And as to warn predators, hey, you don't want to mess with me. I either taste really bad, or I'm venomous or poisonous. In this case, they have a formidable stinger, but the venom within that stinger is geared exclusively towards invertebrates, specifically cicadas. So if you actually get stung by cicada killer, it's not really gonna hurt. You know, bees and wasps and stuff are gonna hurt a lot more, even though their stinger is way smaller than that of a cicada killer. It's pretty cool stuff. Now, I'm sure you heard me say that cicada killers are completely non-aggressive species of wasp, right? They don't have to be. I mean, look how big they are. That alone probably warns a lot of predators. You don't want to mess with them. The fact that they have those striking black and yellow coloration generally says, I'm dangerous, look at my aposomatic coloration, I will defend myself with poison, venom, or a nasty bite, and uh, that usually gets the point across to any would-be predators. Of course, I'm sure there's a lot of people watching this video and they're sitting there shaking their heads at the screen being like, no, I've been chased by these things. They're totally aggressive. They're monsters with drooling mouths, you know, hunting humans at any chance they have. Just like most of the snakes people tell me about, you know, I swear I was chased by that snake and I don't even want to go there right now. But to prove my point, I'm going to show you how aggressive these wasps really are. I mean, you can practically knock them from hand to hand without getting stung, but I do not suggest you ever touch or handle or disturb wildlife. I mean, if something happens, it's your fault, not the animals, right? And it's not nice. How would you like to get knocked around between two hands just to show that you're friendly? Huh. Yeah, Chris, sure, the, the cicada killer is not aggressive. Well, it's the end of the day, it's getting cold out, or perhaps the wasp has reached old age and so it doesn't want to fight with anything. Or maybe it's attacked and stung so many cicadas that it's purely exhausted. Well, what can I do? You know, I mean, some people possibly just want to argue no matter what you say or do and I'm not going to bother.
Did you know that there's actually a type of wingless wasp that predates on the larva of cicada killers? This type of wasp is known as the velvet ant or cow killer. What goes on is the velvet ant will seek out the burrows that the cicada killers have dug out and she will climb down in there and lay a single egg on the larva of the cicada killer. When that egg hatches, the velvet ant larva will feed on the larva of the cicada killer, which of course is feeding on the cicada. What a crazy cycle of events going on. The velvet ants have developed this super strong exoskeleton in order to defend themselves against the massive stingers of the cicada killers. How about that? You know, if you want to learn more about velvet ants, check out my link somewhere around here on the velvet ants because they're an incredible species and they're very beautiful. They look like ants, but they're a type of wingless wasp. You know how hard it is to uh, work with wasps? I'm sorry, cicada killers? To actually handle them? And it's not to handle them without getting stung. It's to handle them at all. Wow, so that is the cicada killer. It's a big wasp, isn't it? I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but might as well not be. This thing is huge, but it's beautiful to look at. They're so elegant and graceful with their work. They're so strong, too. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you how strong this animal is when you interact with it. Real strong legs and, and a strong thorax to handle all those, those powerful wing muscles to carry their cicadas off to their burrows. I love cicada killers. It's the Hymenoptera group of animals, you know, the wasps and bees and, and ants and sawflies too. It's possibly my favorite group of invertebrates and the cicada killer is one of my very favorite species of wasp out there because they are just impressive and beautiful to look at. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you learned some cool stuff about cicada killers and maybe the next time you see one, you'll actually feel comfortable enough to get close to it and observe this animal and appreciate her beauty and its function in the great ecosystem of our environment. And uh, you will not be struck down with fear or some horrible fiery stinger that you'll actually feel safe and be able to appreciate this animal for the beauty that Mother Nature has provided us with. Chris Ignato, signing out. It's probably the most famous Coast Guard boat too, because it's on like every other episode of Deadliest Catch, like, everyone knows that boat. <laughs> That's so funny.